In this module, we're going to show you how to protect yourself from the very beginning from either deals going sideways or making a mistake by choosing the wrong kinds of investors. You know, the investors that are just nightmares. So this is a very simple process. Uh, there's really two different kinds of decisions that we need to make. The first decision that we have to make is about entity types. So we'll go over what the basic entity types are. And then we'll also go through what the structures look like and that structures of typical syndication companies and how they run their deals. Once you have that in mind, you'll know how to basically build that whole framework that lets you do syndications in a much safer way. And this really boils down to protecting you as the syndicator from anything going wrong and protecting you from liability. That's one of the, the, the key tenements that we want to do, because if you ignore that, suddenly you could be liable for a lot of money for things that were just simple mistakes or just acts of God that you didn't have control over. topic of entity selection and structures may only be interesting to lawyers, but I'll tell you, you'd be surprised how important this is. So let me tell you a little story, and this isn't about a syndicator, but it is about commercial real estate. So and I invite you, go ahead and Google about this as well and look it up. Look up Ghost Ship Fire and you'll see the articles that pertain to it. So here's what happened. In 2016, there was a series, there was a bunch of buildings that was owned by one woman in the Bay Area of California. And she owned, like I said, about 20 buildings. And one of those buildings was known as the ghost ship. Now she had rented out that, uh, that building and she knew that the people who were living there uh, really weren't supposed to be living there. They were supposed to be doing, um, I believe it was supposed to be an office building. Um, and she knew that they were doing something more like cohabitating living and uh, something like that. Well, in 2016, there was a huge fire at this building known as the ghost ship, uh, which had been, was being used for like a big party. Uh, people were unable to uh, escape through the exits that uh, didn't have the proper fire doors. 36 people died, two severely injured out of that. So catastrophic deaths. Now, why this relates to structure is because she owned all 20 of those buildings in her trust. Now, a trust is just another entity type, just like the other entities we're going to go over today, that you wouldn't use a trust for syndicating. But she decided to put all of her properties just inside of her trust and thought she was protected. She doesn't own 20 buildings anymore. So that's why this is so incredibly important. So let's get right into it and discuss what is... Um, Uh, what uh, the basic entity types that we're talking about are. So we've got uh, a few different choices that you could make. Now, if you chose to put everything under your own name, you will be basically acting as a sole proprietor. You'll be acting as a sole proprietor. That is just you. There is no liability protection, and um, and that's all it is. And there's more detail in the notes for here. Uh, we've given you a, a handout as part of this module that breaks this down into a table similar to what I'm, I'm drawing right here. Uh, but for our purposes, I'm going to go through it a little bit faster uh, than the level of detail that's there. So there's the sole proprietor. Then there is a partnership. And this is two or more people coming together for a common enterprise. Then there is your limited liability partnership. 
And then there is your limited liability company. And finally, there are corporations. Now, you may be asking, well, what about S corporations versus C corporations? Well, S corporations versus C corporations are not specific kinds of corporations. They're ways of being taxed. And so we'll talk about taxes uh, just very, very briefly here, um, but that's why it doesn't say S corp versus C corp. So let's just look at a few little things that, that kind of call this out. And as I go through these, start thinking about what makes most sense for you uh, in terms of number of people involved, the asset protection, um, the maintenance and governance, and taxes. Because at the end of the day, there's probably one entity type that makes the most sense for you. So when it comes to a uh, sole proprietor, we're talking about there's one person and that's you. Everything is under you, your name, your social security number or an EIN that is assigned specifically to you as a person. There is no asset protection whatsoever in uh, a sole proprietor. In terms of maintenance and governments, though, it's very, very simple. There may be you have to do a, uh, a DBA, a doing business as filing uh, with your local municipality, but that's it. And then in terms of taxes, this all goes on your individual taxes. You don't have a choice about that. Now. Uh, let's talk about partnerships. Partnerships are always two or more people. There is no, uh, there's no asset protection for the general partner. That's the people doing all of the work, for, but there is a limited amount for, um, for limited partners. The governance is actually pretty easy. There is not a lot that you need to do for a partnership, but check with your local state if this is something of interest to you. Um, and then in terms of taxes, you probably are going to be paying as a partnership. Then there is your LLP which also requires there be two or more people. And now there's some asset protections for the general partner and good asset protection for the, the limited partners. So why would you choose a, a, a partnership over an LLP? Really, it comes down to cost of filing and then this, um, the, the difficulty of governance it, uh, governing it. There can be some a moderate amount of maintenance that needs to be taken place on the LLP in order to keep it valid. And you will be taxed as a partnership. Now we get to the LLC and the LLC can have just one person. Um, but in order for it to have the best kind of level of asset protection, really, uh, it should be, you know, two or more people in the same sort of format where you have someone acting like a general partner. So that would be your managing members of the LLC in order to manage it. And then, um, and we'll talk about managed, uh, member managed versus manager managed LLCs, uh, in just a bit. Um, so one or more people for an LLC, uh, it has, uh, it has good asset protection and also easy to moderate, uh, governance, not very difficult. Um, but there is some work to be done. Again, check with your local state or where you're going to be filing, uh, and that will have specifically what those things are, 
what the dates are that you're going to have to send things in, uh, make elections, that sort of thing, and then also um, what those filing fees are. In terms of taxes though, now it starts being a little bit more interesting. You have a choice of either being taxed as a partnership or an S-Corp. Which should you choose, partnership or an S-Corp? Well, that's one of those questions where I'm going to say you probably should talk to your accountant because once we start getting into how those distributions happen, then the answer changes radically, whether there's somebody um, should be doing a partnership or an S-Corp, what makes the most sense for them. Um, so that one is better to ask uh, your personal accountant who knows the who knows your situation and what you're doing much much better than we could possibly do on a module in terms of corporations we can also just have one person in most jurisdictions there is good asset protection though slightly different than in an llc but the maintenance of them tends to be fairly complex you need to have a board of directors. Uh, that board of directors may not do anything, but they need to be there. They need officers and there needs to be all these rules that need to take place. Now, while your LLC will have an operating agreement, your corporation will have bylaws. Typically, the things that are required for a corporation to stay active as and look like a real uh company in order to get that asset protection that you want uh, there's just more things you have to do regular minutes have to be taken from board meetings etc um, so they're just more complex it's not to say that it's not a it, it's not the best choice because it could be if you need a very specific kind of governance in order to look right for investors uh, then a corporation is a perfect way to set up um, a, a REITs are always set up as corporations in one of their main entities and then a lot of times they have other different structures in those other entities as well. Also if you're going to be issuing shares rather than membership units so typically for like a blind pool you'll do it as a corporation because it's a little bit easier to manage what that looks like. And then taxes is either your S Corp or your C Corp. So again, look at the handout uh, to really kind of see what would make the most sense for your situation and kind of write out what's important to you. You know, if you've got more than one person, well, you're not going to be doing a sole proprietor um, and you probably shouldn't do a sole proprietor anyway. Um, most of the time you're going to be choosing between either an LLC and a, a corporation. So let's go and talk about common structures and we'll see how this plays out a little bit clearer. So, uh, like I said, in a, there are two kinds of LLCs. There are, is a, uh, manager managed and this is just background we need to have the rest of the conversation and there is member managed and it's probably self-evident but an LLC that's manager managed is managed by a manager a manage uh, an LLC that's member managed is managed by its members um, what that means is all the de regular decision making that takes place is either going to be made by the manager or the member. Now, in the typical structure that we do, um, typically we are using, uh, there are two different layers of entities. So we have your syndicator entity. And I'm going to just draw that. And there is your, oops, I was already drawing the picture. And there is your investment entity. 
And almost always you will use these kind of structures. Um, so our syndicator entity is typically either an LLC or a, a corporation. I generally don't see um, anything other than those. I guess it could be an LLP in certain situations. Um, and um, But normally a syndicator themselves is formed as either an LLC or a corporation because they want to get a, the advantage of asset protection. Uh, then your investment entity that is almost always an LLC. It's rare that it's anything other than an LLC. Um, so let's go into the different kinds of structures. So it all starts with you. You are a syndicator. So most are structured like this. As the syndicator, you have formed a syndication entity uh, in order to do your deals and when you find that entity you, uh, when you find that you're the investment that you're going to do, you put together another entity that is called your investment entity. Which your investors all invest into. Now, whether this is manager managed or member managed is, um, is really up to you. Typically, it will be a manager manage entity so that all the decision making about how the investment is run will primarily be made by you. Now, you may very well decide things like when it's time to sell or things like that should be made by all of the investors. Um, that's perfectly reasonable, and I do that most of the time, those kind of decisions. Um, but the decisions about who to choose as a property manager or, um, or those kinds of things, those typically I just leave to management uh, and I don't bring in the, uh, the, the investors. Um, so this is the most common structure. This is probably what you're going to be doing 95% uh, of the time, is a manager-managed um, investment entity with the syndicator entity as the manager. I will give you uh, a little background on why we don't do it this way. So let's say there is a great property And here's you as the syndicator. And so you start syndicating this property. You find some investors to come into the property. Well, midway through, one of these investors gets mad. And he decides that the way this entity is being run is just terrible. And so he sues the entity and he sues you because you are the manager. So you can see, uh, that there is no asset protection whatsoever on this, and now you need to respond to this lawsuit. The other thing that can happen is um, if there is somebody external who slips and falls on the property, they're going to sue the entity, and they're going to sue the manager of that entity, which could be you. So we are trying to avoid that. That isn't a good solution for you. 
uh, we want to give you as much protection as possible. Now, the uh, and that's why we set it up with the syndication entity. So let's go back up here. Erase this. Here, if there's a problem on the entity, well, they can sue the entity and they can sue the manager, but they can't sue the manager of the manager. So that's why you have that syndicator uh, entity there uh, to act as a buffer between you and uh, your investors. So you may be asking, well, that's all well and good, but what about those situations where there's multiple properties that I'm gonna be syndicating? Well, it's very simple. It looks basically like this. So here's your syndicator entity. Now, in this case, so say we've got two buildings. Oh, well, let's do a third building. So you've got these three buildings that you want to invest in. How do you do that so that you can make it something that is easy for your investors to come into? Well, all we do is we put together a single investment entity that you are the manager of and because it's just it's not a property of an entity it's just a it's just the entity itself and then each of these is its own property entity and then your investors they invest in this investment entity and that's the typical structure for what we do in a, in a pool situation um, to make sense. So here's how to start thinking about what makes the most sense. First off, there's no reason to not go ahead and get started and file that syndicator entity as soon as you think, I'm definitely going to be putting a deal together. There are a lot of times costs that are associated with not only putting it together, but many jurisdictions have taxes that apply in, in the first year uh, for entity for the minimum maintenance. So do know that if you decide, yeah, I'm gonna go for it, I'm gonna put this together, it is possible that you're going to be paying some costs, uh, but it also is, the way I like to see it, it's raising your hand to the universe saying, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna make money, I'm gonna put together some syndications. So to me, it's like taking massive action towards uh, your future. So I think it's a good thing in order to form it right away, but you need to decide for yourself whether that makes sense. So I would first form this syndicator entity. And as you start looking for properties, then you can start looking, uh, then when you identify something, you can put together the right investment entity or property entity as it see, as would make the most sense uh, for you. So, uh, make that decision, decide what entity type makes the most sense for you, and then start thinking about, okay, well, that's how I would structure this deal, probably in terms of making it uh, uh, this, a, ma a manager-managed entity, managing one property happens most of the time for, for new syndicators. In the next module, we are gonna talk about how to find investors for your syndication deal.